This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting AetnaStory.com. Hi, this is Trisha. Just a quick reminder before we get to our guest today that the Achieving Optimal Health Conference is on Saturday, October 26th at Georgetown University, and we really hope all of you plan to join us. You'll come and be inspired by luminaries in health and wellness and take home real strategies to improve your happiness and wellness. You can get all the information you need at AchievingOptimalHealthConference.com. And now for the show. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Matt Dawson has been obsessed with performance optimization as long as he can remember. He received scholarships to play two sports in college, even with minimal talent, because of his voracious reading and implementation of any fitness or nutritional techniques that would give him an edge. He continued that obsession in medical school, and as a physician, he has won numerous national awards for education, innovation, and leadership. He has lectured in over 20 countries and trained thousands of other physicians through live lecture, online education, two textbooks, and even an educational app. He combines his training in genomics and functional medicine to give personalized, precise medical guidance. His obsession with performance optimization has morphed from initially athletic to now mental performance, business performance, and longevity. Whether it's a professional athlete or a grandparent optimizing their mental clarity and mobility to keep up with their grandkids, Dr. Dawson is passionate about helping everyone perform at their absolute peak. He's an expert in precision medicine, and we thought it would be fun to focus our discussion today on CBD oil. There is so much confusion around CBD, and that is exactly why we want to talk about it. Matt Dawson, welcome to Health Gig. Thank you so much for having me. CBD is the rage, and depending on who you ask, it's either hype or a miracle worker. So how did it gain so much popularity? I think there is a lot of great science behind CBD. Personally, I became interested in it in the last few years. My medical practice is a genomics-based personalized medicine practice, and I was getting more and more patients asking me about it, just telling me about the incredible results they were getting with it. So I really had to educate myself and kind of dig into the science. And To be honest, I was really impressed with the science, but then when I started looking into it, I became pretty concerned with, like you mentioned, it's kind of the wild, wild west. The popularity has grown simply because it works. At this point, we don't have a lot of great double-blinded, randomized, controlled trials in the U.S. because it's been illegal. But if you talk to anybody who's taking it, I mean, I was having patients come to me with MS, for example, and it's the only thing that helped their pain or people with chronic injuries and pain that they'd had for years and it was helping them or with sleep or so many other things. And I think everybody kind of has a story themselves or knows someone who has a story. And the research from other countries is pretty impressive as well. So it's something that just seems to work. And I think that's why it's gained so much traction. So, Matt, as you talk about, you're all about precision medicine, all about what we call bioindividuality, that every individual is different, every body is different. So when we're out there and people are asking us about CBD oil, some people say they can use it for sleep and some people say they can't. It doesn't work for them for that. It's interesting. Have you found that? And what do you think about that? It's like any medication. It's like anything you do, any sort of therapeutic. It doesn't work for everyone. And honestly, that's why I practice how I practice. Every patient that we see, we run their genetic sequence, their DNA, look at their lab test, look at their microbiome. And then we individualize not just medications, but what is the right diet for someone? What's the right exercise? What are the right supplements? And it's the same thing for CBD. The reason it doesn't work the same for everyone is because no one is the same. I mean, just to give you a specific example, there's actually a specific genetic SNP called uh, FAAH, it stands for fatty acid amide hydrolase. And depending on your specific SNP there, uh, you're going to have higher or lower metabolism of that fatty acid amide hydrolase. It leads to higher or lower levels of anandamide. And that affects how well CBD works for you. That's the same for every medication and every other therapeutic, but there's a reason that it works for some people and not for other people. And it could work for some people in one way and to other people in another way, right? So it could help me sleep and it might help you with anxiety. That's correct. It also 
works at different dosages for mm-hmm. different indications. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. The problem with CBD is that there's just not enough good scientific data out there, not enough good education. So you mentioned anxiety and sleep, for example. Lower doses tend to work better for anxiety and chronic pain, but much higher doses for sleep. So sometimes when people say, okay, it works for my anxiety, but not my sleep, it's simply a dosing matter. 15 to 25 milligrams, for example, what I find helps for anxiety or chronic pain. When you look at the studies on sleep, it's 100 to 150 milligrams. It's a very different dosage. And very few people understand the pharmacodynamics and how it works. And that's because we've treated it like a supplement. But honestly, we really should be looking at more like a medicine and a a strong therapeutic. And also because it's not regulated, obviously, because it's so new, sometimes we won't or shouldn't, right, trust what the dosage would be. Do you agree with that? I mean, you really kind of got to know where it's coming from. That's a huge issue. I mean, you nailed it on the head there. When I started looking at some of the research, my wife, for example, she's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and adult psychiatrist, and she was seeing some of the great studies out of Israel for kids with autism, and she was training a lot of kids on the spectrum. But the problem is when we really dig in or when a parent asks about it, if you look at some of the studies that were done on just what you can get and buy here in the U.S., 80% of what was out there, I saw in one study, didn't have close to what they claimed. It was either too much, too little, or no CBD in it. Honestly, that's what pushed me. I found some chemists, and now I have a chemist with a PhD in genomics, a chemist with a PhD in plant physiology, and we're actually growing our own. I felt so uncomfortable with what was out there. We actually are producing our own for our patients at this point. I think CBD comes from a hemp plant, and you have to correct me because I don't know for sure. But what is CBD? What is it made of? Sure, you're exactly right. It comes from the hemp plant. That's part of the reason why there's a stigma around it, because obviously THC does as well. Now, there's multiple different strains and genetics of hemp. And so specifically, CBD comes from hemp that has a very small amount of THC in it. So, for example, I I told you we grow our own now. I live in Kentucky, and that's probably the best place in the world for growing hemp. And we grow that, but by regulation, it has to have less than 0.3% THC in it. So it's not legal if it doesn't. So it is the hemp plant, and then that is harvested. And then at our lab, we extract it with a very gentle process, and we isolate the CBD from a lot of the other plant material that is not necessary. Is it the leaf part of the plant, or what is it? The flower, yes. The flower. Is there a purity issue involved? It, just like any kind of plant that you would ingest, or uh, most of our pharmaceuticals are, do come from plants as well. The plant itself matters. What the farmers used, whether they used pesticides or chemicals, that matters to the quality. And then the extraction process. Uh, most of the big extractors in the U.S. will use what's called supercritical CO2. That's fine. It's a very efficient process, but it also strips out a lot of the terpenes and phytocannabinoids and other beneficial parts of the plant as well. So we actually use a much gentler process. It's not as efficient, but efficiency isn't our goal. Quality is our goal. So we think that leaving a lot of those natural products in makes for more efficacious product. You may have heard of the entourage effect. That's just that the closer to the whole plant that you get, the more therapeutic it is. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, Joan Di Gussow. She was kind of the matriarch of the eat locally and think globally food movement. She said, I trust cows more than chemists. She was talking about butter versus margarine and how we made margarine. We thought it was a great thing and we found out how damaging it is to our health. And it's the same thing when I look at CBD extractors and those that try to really isolate CBD and strip out everything else. I think they're just missing the point. We've evolved over thousands of years with this plant and I don't think we're smarter than the plant. So we do a very gentle extraction. We think that leads to a higher quality CBD product. Can you talk to us about the endocannabinoid system? And really, is this something we should be talking about? We didn't learn about that in school. Like we learned about the lymph system and we learned about the endocrine system, but we really didn't learn about this. Is that something we should know about? For sure. I mean, the the endocannabinoid system, everyone has an endocannabinoid system when you have receptors pretty much throughout your entire body and your brain, on your pancreas, it's everywhere. To be honest with you, anyone that tells you they know exactly how CBD works is not being honest because we don't have enough research, but we know that it works on the endocannabinoid system and we know that it has a lot of beneficial effects. It binds to CB1 and CB2 receptors, but it doesn't actually bind that tightly. It really is more of an agonist, but doesn't really bind to them so tightly. And we know that it affects anandamide, and that's what's called the bliss compound in the body. So we kind of know why it works and how it works, but we just don't have great data on that 
just yet. We know that it helps seizures. It's FDA approved for that. There's an actual medication for Dravo syndrome. We know that it helps with anxiety, with chronic pain, with a lot of other things. The exact mechanisms are really still teasing out, but it has to do with how it acts on the endocannabinoid system, the system that's throughout our body, like you mentioned. Yeah, and that sounds pretty important to understand that, because once you understand that, then we can kind of understand how it works. That's true. However, the more important part is to just know what it does. Um, I mean, just to give an example of that, everyone knows what SSRIs are, serotonin, selective right. serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression and anxiety. But to be honest, we don't really have a perfect scientific understanding of, of how they work. We just know they do. And that's the same with a lot of medications. So we don't have a perfect understanding of the complex biochemistry and metabolism of CBD. But we do have a pretty good understanding. And the most important thing to me as a physician treating patients is I see it working. I have studies showing that it works. And the safety profile, it's a very efficacious drug and it's got a really wide safety of margin. So there are studies in really massive doses for prolonged periods of time with very little minimal side effects or negative effects. So to me, if it works at a dose that's nowhere close to the toxic dose, that's the most important thing to me. And we are getting a more nuanced understanding of the mechanisms, but we're just not there yet. I have a question. I and Tricia knows that I've used the CBD oil effectively for sleep and it does make me fall asleep. Is there a slightly psychoactive component to it because I do fall asleep pretty easily with it? That's a great question, and it's kind of a loaded question and loaded term. So is it psychoactive? So if you Google, you'll see everything saying it's not psychoactive. It's not like THC, but right. anything that works on your brain is psychoactive. So you could define it as psychoactive by that measure. It works great for my sleep. Every patient that we have, we actually have them order an aura ring to track their sleep. And it's important to me to know, is this truly working or not? So for example, my aura ring, every morning I wake up and I see how much deep sleep, REM sleep, the entire sleep architecture. And for our patients, if someone has trouble with sleeping and I recommend CBD, we actually have a specific blend with CBD and melatonin for some people mm. because some people have a MTNR and 1A polymorphism that affects the melatonin receptors. So for them, I'll do the combination. But whatever we recommend, we try it for a week and we look at their actual data. How much does it improve their deep and their REM sleep? And for me, it has a profound effect on my deep sleep, which is really the more restorative and more important part of your sleep. So it does work for a lot of people. The fact that it affects your sleep and the fact that it affects anxiety means technically it is psychoactive, but it doesn't make you high like THC. Right. So that's an important distinction. I have a question about purchasing CBD oil. When people work with you, they have the benefit of knowing the right CBD oil because it's under your supervision. But most people are buying CBD oil at their local Whole Foods or something. And so how do you recommend they navigate that? That's a great question. So no one is going to kind of geek out on it and be as much of a nerd as I am about it. But so you don't have to understand all the metabolism and the mechanisms, but it is helpful to educate yourself a little bit. So how to pick the right CBD. You want to find a company that has their third-party reports and their COAs or certificate of analysis available online. So if you go to their website, you should be able to find that. If you don't see that, I wouldn't buy the product. So that's one thing that's important. Another thing, there's so many CBD companies popping up. It's so unregulated. You really should go with one of the bigger brands that has that testing. As far as monitoring and safety, I don't want to scare people, but so many people are getting into it that it's just so unregulated that it's scary. So I think the number one thing is just third-party testing results. So go to the website of a company, of a brand that you want. And we actually, our patients come to us sometimes taking a certain one, and we have the luxury our lab where we produce it, we actually have a GC mass spec system and we will test other companies. So if someone comes to us with a brand that they want us to test, we can actually just do that for a few hundred dollars and see if it's a good one or not. Third-party testing should be available online for a reputable company. What are your thoughts about CBD oil in food? Because we're seeing it everywhere. You know, you can get your CBD cookies. As a physician and scientist, it bothers me a, a little bit. <laughs> it's got a wide safety margin, and so it's not a horrific thing. But at the same time, one of the things that bothered me when I first started getting into this is I just saw all these orange creamsicle-flavored CBD. or these, right. it, People were treating it like candy instead of plant medicine, which it is. We should take it seriously. And when I see edibles, for example... CBD is not very bioavailable when you just ingest it. Now, that's the point with CBD oil. You take it sublingually and you absorb many times more sublingually than when you swallow. So 
if someone doesn't know how to take this, if they just put the CBD oil in their mouth and they swallow, they're going to get a much smaller amount than if they hold it under their tongue or in their mouth for several minutes. So when you just put it in something like a cookie, you're eating that. You're not putting that in your mouth and holding it. And it's just not that bioavailable. It's more of a marketing gimmick than anything else. I don't think it's harmful, but it's not efficacious and people aren't treating it like a plant medicine, which I feel like they should. And we've actually even seen water enhance CBD. That's a tricky one just because people talk about it being water-soluble. It's not. CBD oil is is not water-soluble. There are some things you can do to it in isolate forms and maybe make it water-soluble, but then you lose a lot of that entourage effect, like I mentioned, and you're stripping out a lot of other things that are important. So I look a little bit askance at some of the things like the CBD water and other things. There could be some benefits, but really you're losing a lot of the benefits of this plant. Along the same lines, can CBD interact with other drugs? Absolutely. It is a drug, and it's got a specific enzyme pathway. Just, for example, to get specific, not not to get too far in the weeds, CBD is metabolized by a specific pathway, specifically the CYP2C19 and the CYP3A4 enzymes in the liver and intestines. So if you're taking a medication, it's also metabolized by those pathways, and it could slow down or speed up that metabolism so you could have more or less in your system. Now, we don't think this is a really big deal, but it could be for some people. So while there is a large safety margin, like I mentioned, I do think people probably should let their physician know. The problem with that, to be honest, is that not many physicians know much about it either, so they may not be that helpful, but you probably should talk to your physician if you're on other medications before taking it. CBD oil Everyone's so excited about it, you know, like it's a panacea. And you were saying there's a large margin of no side effects or little. But with any kind of plant medicine, you could experience nausea, right, or tiredness. And would you call this an adaptogen? Absolutely. I rank it. I mean, when I have people with uh, adrenal fatigue and things, we talk about adaptogens. We talk about chaga, ashwagandha, and CBD is one I add to the list. It's it's a really great adaptogen. But yes, it can at certain dosages or for certain people or people taking certain medications have different effects. The fact it's metabolizing the liver as well. I have talked to some researchers in the U.S. who are some of the bigger researchers. We're just now starting to get some studies and these aren't released yet, but we can have some elevations in liver function tests. And we don't think there's hepatic toxicity, but Anytime we see that, it makes us just worry about the higher dosages. It is an adaptogen. It does have a wide safety margin. But yes, people can have nausea from it. Even our CBD, for example, because it's so close to the original plant form, it does have a very kind of cannabis forward flavor. So some people really don't like the flavor or they may just have a reaction to how that tastes or they may have a sensitivity to the plant itself. Like anything, you probably should start slow if you're going to try this and work up to figure out what works for you without having as many side effects. Is it true, too, that you take the proper dosage and then eventually you don't need it anymore and that that situation may be gone, for example, with anxiety or even sleep? That's a great question. We don't know that. There are no studies I could point to you and show that, okay, this fixed that problem. It very well could be because it is an adaptogen, like you mentioned. But if I just look at the mechanisms themselves, we think it's working on the endocannabinoid system. It technically, once it's eliminated, it has about a 24-hour half-life. And it's really probably not working on the endocannabinoid system. Now, having said that, some things that we're talking about, like anxiety and chronic pain, for example, those are really difficult loops that people get in. The way the brain fires and kind of reinforces that anxiety and pain, it could be that having a certain amount of time of relief by really affecting kind of the natural endocannabinoid system, that you get better from those and you don't need it anymore. What you're saying could totally be true. There are no studies showing that to be true, though, but it definitely could be just thinking through the physiology of it and how the body works, especially with some of those diseases that it works on. When did this sort of idea start, CBD oil separated from THC compound, begin to kind of make news? Yeah, really probably about five or six years ago. I mean, it's been out there for a while, but I started a nonprofit with two close friends, one who is a really distinguished professor and researcher at Harvard. He's the first person that gave it to me. And when he gave it to me, uh, he said, it's CBD. And I thought, what in the world? Why is this guy giving me drugs, this (laughs) guy that I trust? And I was kind of baffled by it. Uh, And that was about five years ago, and I'd really heard nothing about it until then. And that's when I really started kind of researching it as well. So it's been around a long time, but I think it's really come into the public consciousness more in the last five years or so. And then with the farm bill last year, that's when it's really exploded in popularity.
But as a physician, were you like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing for my patients? Or did you go in after experiencing it with your friend? Were you kind of like a little bit nervous about it? Or were you like, no, this is good? I wouldn't say I was a little nervous. I would say I was very nervous um, (laughs) because it's just so unregulated. The reason I was very nervous is because it works, but there's no regulation. I guess it could be an exciting combination, but it's also for me as someone treating patients, it's a pretty scary thing just because it was going to be very hard. I knew to kind of control and make sure they were getting the quality sources that I would want them to get when there just was really no regulation on it. Anybody could just get some product and extract it with butane in their garage or, or anything. It was really kind of a scary time and it really pushed me to educate myself and then to try to start educating others as well. How far away are we from good, reliable FDA research? There is some good research, but most of it is from overseas, from Europe and other places. Like I mentioned, the Israeli study on on autism. U.S. studies, I know they're underway right now. I mean, I talked to some of these researchers, probably the biggest research study on autism. I know I've been following that really closely because we do treat a fair amount of kids on the spectrum, and we've seen it's powerful. And we're actually, this isn't really available to the public yet, but we actually have combined it with a broccoli seed extract called sulforaphane because we know that works really well for kids with autism. It should be coming out in the next year or so. It takes a while for studies to really come out, but I expect in the next year or two, there's going to be kind of an onslaught of studies coming out and we'll have more data, exactly how much to take for which indications. And it'll be great to have all that. And to be honest, I'm hopeful that we'll actually have more regulation on it than less, just because I think it's needed. Consumers really do need guidelines. Like We really Mm -hmm. do need to know how much to take for this and how much to take for that. As you said, it should be treated with respect and as a plant medicine, because it is a medicine. Yeah, it's scary when I talk to people. I get a lot of questions about this just because not many physicians know about it, and I've educated myself. And even when I ask people, how much are you taking? They say three drops or a drop of full. And I have no idea what that means, and neither do they. Because the milligram per milliliter, the dosages can be all over the place. And so it's just not treated like a medicine right now. It's not taken as seriously as it should be. Can you tell us your definition of an adaptogen? It's something that kind of stabilizes physiologic processes. Your body wants to be in homeostasis at all times. And normally we think of something, for example, of being depressing or as being energizing, one of the two. But an adaptogen tends to help your body maintain homeostasis and kind of stabilizes physiologic processes so that your body can just better take care of itself and yeah, just remain in homeostasis. Uh, it doesn't have a specific effect in one direction or the other. Chaga, ashwagandha, CBD, those are the kind of the classic things that I think about and mention to patients. But something that doesn't have a specific effect, it tends to have positive effects, whichever way the body needs to go to rebalance and become more in homeostasis. It's just so, so fascinating to know that these plants are out there that can just support us in whatever way we need them. I don't know, it sounds like a miracle or something, Mm -hmm. but they work. You hit on a great point when you, you talk about plants. You don't get that effect all that often with medicines that we, right. the scientists, and, and we make because we make them for very specific purposes. But when you talk about plants who have evolved alongside humans with us for thousands of years, are just a really nice synergy there. And we have this endocannabinoid system. I don't know if I believe this, but I've actually heard some people who I respect well just talk about maybe we just have an endocannabinoid deficiency at baseline. Most people do. We have this system. We have some natural endocannabinoids, but because this plant has been so maligned and it's it's criminalized and it's kind of a regular natural form, we aren't getting it. Maybe we need it kind of like vegetables and like a lot of our vegetables. And now I'm not uh, proposing (laughs) that, but I heard someone say that recently who I respect and I thought, that's an interesting hypothesis. That actually could be right. It'll be interesting as we get more and more research on the endocannabinoid system in this plant. I'm laughing because I can just hear teenagers coming to dinner and saying, you know, mom, I really need my vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what this person was talking, we were talking about, they said, you know what, it should be grown in the backyard like a tomato plant. You put it in a blender in your smoothie and uh, that's probably going a little far. And and I am worried about the teenagers and others. This is a, this is strong plant medicine, but maybe we'll find out more in the near future with all the science that's happening now. It's an exciting time. You know, you think about people that are in lots of pain, and I'm thinking about cancer patients. And I know a lot of folks that we work with that are cancer patients have been aware of this for a long time for CBD oil. And I guess they've been actually using it after using marijuana, and you can get paranoid and all that. I guess this sort of debunks that. Is that true? 
So you're saying people who use marijuana and they will actually add CBD on as well to offset some of the negative effects? Yes, of that yeah, and, I'm, and these would be people yeah. that are using it for medical reasons. That's absolutely something that happens. Uh, CBD itself actually is a competitive agonist for your CB receptors, which where THC binds as well. So absolutely, if someone combines CBD with THC, and then we get a lot of the kind of anti-nausea effects of THC, but less of the psychoaffective parts or the paranoia or the, the high that comes along with THC. So, no, there's good science for that. There's a good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Which is fascinating. This whole conversation's been fascinating. Matt, you would mentioned that you used the aura ring a little earlier in our conversation. Yes, the aura ring. We were wondering if you could spend a little time telling us about it and what it does and how it could help people. I used to think of health in general as kind of three legs to the stool. There's nutrition, there's exercise, and there's sleep. And I always focused on the nutrition and exercise. But honestly, after looking at all the research, I've come to believe that sleep is not only as important, but the most the important. Most important. Uh, yeah. It really is. And so with our patients, every patient that we see, we order an Aura Ring. Right now, we think that's the best sleep tracker. And we actually use an Aura Ring cloud service, so we actually follow along with their sleep. We can do experiments and be data-driven. So we look at their sleep each night, and then we can recommend different therapeutics, instead of just giving melatonin to everyone or trying specific CBTI, or there's a hundred things we could do for sleep. We want to see what works. And this is a tool that allows us to see what works. So you could do that yourself. If you get the ring, we know general guidance for darkness and certain temperatures of your room, not eating a certain amount of time before you go to bed, all these things that should work. And then there's all the supplements that are out there. There's tryptophan, there's melatonin, there's GABA, there's all these things. But instead of just trying it, everyone is different. And this is one way you can Try something for a week. See how it affects your deep and your REM sleep. I recently discovered pulse electromagnetic field. I've been reading a lot of research and started trying it, and it was profound, the difference that it had on my deep sleep. I was just shocked by it, and I would never have known that if I didn't have the aura ring, um, and now I've incorporated that into kind of my wellness routine, and I'm talking to a lot of the patients about it. So it's just a way to quantify and to really dial in something as nebulous sometimes as sleep. I don't like to ask my patients, how is your sleep? Is it good or right. bad? Yeah. Because it's great, the perception, that's important, but I also would love to have some objective data so that I know if we're making progress or not, and it allows us to have that. And it's not the only sleep tracker. Right now, I've discovered a really cool thing called Cocoon, um, and I have no relationship with any of these, mm -hmm. or Ring or Cocoon or any of those, but I'm really interested in it as well. But right now, I do think if you're interested in sleep tracking and optimizing it, I think the Aura Ring is probably the best tool that there is right now. You know, you said, and we agree, that after studying, you know, nutrition and everything and exercise, that sleep kind of trumps all. Can you explain why the body needs sleep and why it is so important? Again, I, I love talking about sleep um, yes. just as much or more than CBD. So, <laughs> and it makes sense. So you think about food, for example. We know how important nutrition is. There are great studies on if you don't get a good night's sleep, if you're sleep deprived, number one, you make poor decisions around food. But even if you have incredible willpower and you make perfect decisions, if you're trying to lose weight, for example, and you're in a calorie deficit state, if you're sleep deprived, your body preferentially goes after muscle and breaks it down for calories. If you're not sleep deprived, then it goes after the fat. Exercise, we know you're not gonna work out as well if you're sleep deprived. Even if you do, you're many times more likely to get injured. Your muscles just aren't firing like they should. I've read every book there is that I can find in this because I'm, I'm obsessed with sleep and mm -hmm. the science behind it. But I was really excited when Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, came out. And now it's one book I can recommend to all my patients that's where I would go for those of you who want to really deep dive into the science and know why and understand how to fix your sleep. Do you think that sleep or lack of sleep does correlate with dementia and Alzheimer's and all of that? This is a big focus of our practice. We look at genetics and we dive into this. I think sleep is the biggest risk factor for dementia and Alzheimer's. I truly do. And when we do someone's genetics, we look at specific markers, not only the ApoE4, which a lot of people know about, but your MTNR1A and your MTNR2 receptors. So how many melatonin receptors and how people process melatonin, it actually increases or decreases the risk for Alzheimer's later. And then we just look at how prevalent sleep disruption is for Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Mm -hmm. Some people used to think, okay, which is the cause? Uh, we don't know the directionality there. But I think the research is becoming more and more clear that it's a tremendous risk factor. We know that when you sleep, that's when your lymphatic system is activated and clears out all of these toxins that build up in your brain. And if you're not doing that appropriately, you're just really setting yourself up for some bad things. And it's not just dementia and Alzheimer's. 
it's pretty much every chronic disease. We do this incredible experiment in the U.S. every year that we call daylight savings time. And uh-huh. when we lose an hour of sleep, that one day, I used to be an emergency room physician before I transitioned. And that one day each year, we see a spike in heart attacks and strokes. And so to think about what we're doing to ourselves when we're chronically being sleep deprived, it's really scary. And I think it's a big public health issue. Uh-huh. Reading why we sleep and Getting a sleep tracker and trying to optimize that is a really fantastic thing that people could do just for their overall health. Bringing it back to CBD oil, that's for a lot of the folks that we work with. They're just wanting to sleep. And I see it very often. But again, I, I like to be objective and data-driven. And so yeah. it's not a cheap thing either. I hate the thought of putting someone on something and then them being on it forever and not knowing if it truly was the thing or not. So having the aura ring is a great way to, to see what exactly makes the difference for your sleep. Matt, this is all so fascinating, and we are so looking forward to having you at the conference this year. We often ask our guests what book they think everyone should read. So what book do you recommend? So I have hundreds of books that I'm frequently recommending to my patients, depending on their specific need. If I had to narrow it down, we mentioned Why We Sleep. I think you can't go wrong with that book, as important as sleep is. My favorite book, personally, is a book called The Third Plate. It's not a medical book at all. It's a book about food and sustainability. And then the book that anyone's interested in nutrition, I just have people read The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Mm-hmm. I think you really gotta, just really got to get a good feel for food and why it's so important. So those three, sorry, it's like, it's like you asked me to pick my favorite child when you asked me to pick a, one book <laughs> right. for everybody. But uh, <laughs> any of those three would be tremendous books if you really want to improve your health or just have a fun read with the third plate. And then what about a favorite quote? So I think the quote that I probably find myself saying to people the most, and it has to do with our genomics-based personalized medicine approach, we really try to take a holistic approach to people. And that's a quote by John Muir. I was just in Yosemite a couple weeks ago, and so John Muir is kind of fresh in my mind. And he said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. I see modern medicine and the problems with trying to boil things down to specific organ systems when it's just all connected. There's no mind or body. It's both. They're both. Every system is connected. And honestly, that applies to even the CBD. I mentioned earlier people trying to isolate specific molecules from the plant. And as close as we can get to it, I think that's the way to go. So I love that quote by by John Muir. It's try to remind myself frequently as I'm seeing patients or really doing everything. Everything's connected, and we really need to take a holistic approach to food, to patients, to everything we do. Well, Matt, thank you for joining us today on HealthGate. We've loved having you. We're so happy you're going to be at our conference on October 26th, and we'll just look forward to seeing you then. I can't wait to see you all in person and talk some more. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well.